In a lot of ways, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is a strange story. Forget the dwarves and the magic and all that jazz. The story itself is about a queen who tries again and again to kill a seven-year-old girl for the sole reason that this little girl is more beautiful than her. It is an absurd and horrifying story driven by a single absurd emotion, envy. Simply because she could not bear to be surpassed in beauty by anyone, the queen hated Snow White, and envy and pride like ill weeds grew in her heart higher every day, until she had no peace, day or night. And you know what happens next. We witness a comic tragedy in which a beautiful queen falls and destroys herself in her attempt to destroy someone else. And absurd though it may be, Snow White's tale of self-destructive envy is not unique. It's one of those archetypal stories that has been told again and again in different guises from the beginning of time to the present day. From King Saul's envy of David in the Old Testament to Venus's envy of Psyche in the Metamorphoses of Apuleius, or Artemis's envy of Chione in Ovid's Metamorphosis. From Satan's envy of the Son of God and Adam and Eve in Paradise Lost, to Salieri's envy of Mozart in Peter Schaeffer's play Amadeus. All of these are stories in which an envious individual, who is often in a position of power and authority, attempts to destroy the person they envy, and sometimes they succeed. It's a compelling story formula because it is a feeling that all of us feel, and I think we often feel it without realizing it. In any case, envy is so universal that Aristotle includes it in his textbook on how to manipulate people by exploiting their emotions. But after seeing how absurd envy can be, we are still left wondering, why do we envy? Why do we allow ourselves to be pained by the good that we see in others? And in more extreme cases, why do we want to destroy the people that we perceive to be better than us? Inequality is endemic to existence. Scientists have given us Price's Law and Pareto distributions that graph how unequally everything is distributed in the universe. The top 1% has most of the money in the world. A small fraction of people have all of the talent, all of the good looks. Only a small fraction of people get to be good looking. But of course we don't need studies and statistics to prove to us what we already know intuitively. To be an existing individual is by definition to be different. And to be different is to be, at least in some sense, unequal. Even if we can make everything else equal, give everyone the same amount of fabulous wealth down to the penny, the same amount of super intelligence down to the IQ point, the same talents, the same good looks, the same whimsical personalities, and miraculously the same opportunities in life, and the same situations in life, so that everything is absolutely equal, and so that in theory no one has more privilege than another, even then there would be one inequality, one difference we could not eliminate because you would still be an individual. You would still be your own unique consciousness with your own point of view, inhabiting your own unique point of time and space. We would still be able to make different choices unless of course we implemented such radical equality that everyone was forced to make the same choices and every idea that passed through our heads was somehow the same in everyone. But at that point, we would be neither humans nor individuals. Total equality is impossible. We are consigned to be different from one another. It is a simple, inarguable fact. Some people are going to have good things that you and I simply cannot have. Some people are going to be more talented. Some people are going to be more privileged. We see those differences. We see how those other people have the things that we don't have, and we respond to those differences in other people. Sure, sometimes we overlook them and we don't care. Other times we judge people for their differences. We see people different from us and we think of them as inferior. Sometimes we fear people's differences. But sometimes when we see something in someone else that is good, sometimes we want to possess it. We love, we desire, we lust, and we're jealous. In this vein, Aristotle identified an emotion called zelos, which if you consult your Greek dictionary, means something like eager rivalry zealous imitation, 
Emulation. It's when we see someone else who, in our own opinion, is better than us, or has more than us, and we want to be like them. And so we actually take steps to improve ourselves and to actually be like them. We emulate them. Obviously, this can be good. It can drive us on to be better, to achieve higher excellence. In fact, this is often the root of what we call inspiration. As a child, we see an expert musician play an instrument, we marvel at it, and we think, I want to do that. I want to be like them. I want to be as good as them. Zelos spurs us on to greatness, which is why Aristotle says, Zelos is therefore a good feeling felt by good persons, whereas envy is a bad feeling felt by bad persons. Zelos makes us take steps to secure the good thing in question, to become better, to become more. Envy makes us take steps to stop our neighbor having them. Unlike love or jealousy, envy does not necessarily want to possess the object of its desire. It's already past that point. Envy doesn't want to become better. It wants only one thing, to destroy to obliterate the greatness that it sees in others, to take away their good things, or if it can't do that, then to make darn well sure that they are not happy. Why should Mozart be allowed to be the greatest composer of all time and no one else? Why does someone else get to be good looking and not me? Why should that person have more money than me? Why did he get promoted at work and not me? Why does everyone like her and no one likes me? There is a primal desire in us to be on top, to be better, to be the greatest, to be at the pinnacle of the dominance hierarchy, the alpha, or in Miltonic terms, to be God. And if we cannot achieve supremacy by rising above others, we will achieve it by tearing them down, by removing them from the equation. If the only way to be the best is to destroy the people who are better than us, then we will destroy them. Fortunately, most of us probably never take drastic steps like the Queen or Satan or Salieri or the Jacobins and Bolsheviks to destroy the people who have more than us. We settle instead for giving the cold shoulder, gossiping, lying, and simple meanness. More than anything, we punish ourselves. We allow ourselves to be eaten up by bitterness. By giving in to envy, we silently torture ourselves more than we torture anyone else. And of course, there's a problem with this. A problem not just with the violence and the animus and uselessly punishing ourselves, but a problem with the desire to be on top altogether. Namely, that being on top, being greater than other people, doesn't make us happy. Having privilege does not make us happy. This is what Milton tried to express in Paradise Lost when he has Satan say, under what torments inwardly I groan, while they adore me on the throne of hell, with diadem and scepter high advanced, the lower still I fall, only supreme in misery. Such joy, ambition, finds. The greatest writers are seldom satisfied with their own writing. The greatest athletes are not impressed at themselves. They're not happy with the gold medal. The greatest artists are seldom content with their own work. People who are great are not happy with their own greatness. That's the irony of so many of these stories. The queen in Snow White is already incredibly beautiful. Satan was already the greatest archangel. Salieri was already the chief composer of the Austrian emperor's court, but these positions of prominence didn't satisfy them. If you could be better than other people, it wouldn't make you happy. Envy itself is a grudging admission, albeit an unconscious one, that it's not enough to be great or successful or talented or wealthy or loved or praised in order to be happy. The key to happiness is not being great at all, but rather the key is seeing greatness in others. While the inequality of existence can become one of the greatest sources of our misery, it can, surprisingly, also be the single greatest source of our happiness. And that's because there is a third way to respond to the inequality of existence, and that is with admiration. In his influential 1964 work, Religion, Values, and Peak Experiences, the psychologist Abraham Maslow identified what he called peak experiences, which are moments of highest happiness and fulfillment in life. The peak experience, the mystic experience, the oceanic feeling. Feelings of limitless horizons opening up to the vision, the feeling of being simultaneously more powerful and more helpless, 
than one ever was before, a feeling of great ecstasy and wonder and awe, the loss of placing in time and space with, and finally the conviction that something extremely important and valuable has happened. Yeah, it's a very good thing for a person. In the peak experience, such emotions as wonder, awe, reverence, humility, surrender, and even worship before the greatness of the experience are often reported. These key words are important because they mean that, in a word, these experiences, the highest points of our lives, are characterized, if not dominated by, of all things, admiration, at least in some form or another. We are never so alive as when we admire. So many people find this so great and high an experience that it justifies not only itself, but even living itself. Peak experiences can make life worthwhile by their occasional occurrence. They give meaning to life itself. They prove it to be worthwhile. It's getting caught up in something outside yourself that makes life worthwhile. It's selfless admiration, not envious self-absorption that makes life meaningful. It proves to the experiencer that there are ends in the world, that there are things or objects or experiences to yearn for which are worthwhile in themselves. This is in itself a refutation of the proposition that life and living is meaningless. Admiration opens the gates to the objective sense that the world is good and valuable. It's the only sure antidote to nihilism, which I think is consuming so many of us today. When we admire, we gain the world, we gain ourselves. In peak experiences, there's a tendency to move more closely to a perfect identity or uniqueness or to the idiosyncrasy of the person or to his real self to have become more a real person. It's admiration that unlocks our true selves. Now the point of all of this has been to show that when we are at our highest, we are defined by admiration, by being rapturously lost in something other than ourselves. This should drive home the power of admiration. And more than that, it should demonstrate our need for admiration. Some inequality is necessary to our happiness. We need people or things who are greater than us. For some, this is a greater cause. For others, it's the cosmos itself. For many, it's God. And while, practically speaking, we can't always live in peak experiences, we can't always be at our highest, we can remain on a higher plateau by cultivating habits of admiration, by disciplining ourselves to find good in things and people, by trying to open our eyes and our very selves to the wonder of the world. Like anything, admiration can be learned and cultivated, and the sooner that we cultivate it, the better. As I said before, inequality is inherent in existence, so we have to come to terms with it. We can hate it and let it eat us up, we can rage against it and try to destroy it, or we can surrender to it, and in so doing, take part vicariously in the greatness that we enjoy by admiring. Not everyone can be great, but everyone can admire, and this is our hope. It's not being admired that makes us happy, in fact, it's the other way around. It's only when we admire that we are happy. It's not being at the top of the dominance hierarchy and looking down on everyone else that makes us satisfied and fulfilled. It's being at the bottom and looking up. Admiration, if we allow it to become a rich experience of our life, means that the superiority of other people becomes the thing that makes the world good and worthwhile. The fact that other people are more talented than me Smarter, better looking, more skilled, funnier is what makes my life rich and rewarding.